I want to thank uh, you for inviting me tonight. You know, it's an honor to be at the Center for National Interest. Immediately before the fall of the Berlin Wall, Francis Fukuyama wrote that we are at the end of history. The world, Fukuyama argued, had arrived at what he called the universal triumph of Western liberal democracy as the final point of human government. Almost 25 years later, we know Fukuyama was either wrong or at the very least a bit optimistic. History hasn't ended. Russia slides backward, vainly hoping to resurrect the Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin justifies aggression in Ukraine as defense against decadent and hypocritical Western powers. In East Asia, Beijing extols the remarkable rise of China as the supremacy of one state capitalism, one party state capitalism. In the Middle East, secular dictatorships have been replaced by the rise of radical jihadist movements who in their beliefs and barbarity represent the antithesis of liberal democracy. These challenges are in part consequences, I think, of failing to define our national security interest in a new era. Our allies and our enemies are, are unsure where America stands. Until we develop the ability to distinguish, as George Kennan put it, between vital interests and more peripheral interests, we will continue to drift from crisis to crisis. Today I want to share with you my views on how to address these threats and how I see America's role in the world. I want to spell out for you what I believe to be the principles of a national security strategy of strength and action. Americans want strength and leadership, but it doesn't mean that we see war as the only solution. Reagan had it right when he spoke to potential adversaries. He said, our reluctance for conflict should not be misjudged as a failure of will. After the tragedies in Iraq and Libya, Americans are right to expect more from their country when we go to war. Americans shouldn't fight wars where the best outcome is stalemate. America shouldn't fight wars where there's no plan for victory. America shouldn't fight wars that aren't authorized by the American people, by Congress. America should and will fight wars when the consequences, intended and unintended, are worth the sacrifice. The war on terror is not over, and America cannot disengage from the world. President Obama claims that al-Qaeda is decimated. But a recent report by the RAND Corporation tracked a 58% increase over the last three years in jihadist terror groups. To contain and ultimately defeat radical Islam, America must have confidence in our constitutional republic, our leadership, our values. To defend our country, we must understand that a hatred of our values exists and acknowledge that interventions in foreign countries may well exacerbate this hatred, but that ultimately we must be willing and able to defend our country and our interests. As Reagan said, when action is required to preserve our national security, we will act. Will they hate us less if we are less present? Perhaps, but hatred for those outside the circle of accepted Islam exists above and beyond our history of intervention overseas. The world does not have an Islam problem. The world has a dignity problem, with millions of men and women across the Middle East being treated as chattel by their own governments. Many of these same governments have been chronic recipients of our aid. When the anger boils over, as it did in Cairo, the anger is directed not only against Mubarak, but also against the United States because of our support for Mubarak. Some anger is blowback. But some anger originates in an aberrant and intolerant distortion of religion that wages war against all infidels. We can't be sentimental about neutralizing that threat, but we also can't be blind to the fact that drone strikes that inadvertently kill civilians may create more jihadists than we eliminate. The young activist Malala Yousafzai, whom the Taliban in Pakistan shot point blank in the head, for insisting that girls have the right to attend school, she voiced this concern when she met with President Obama. She said, it is true that when there is a drone attack, terrorists are killed, but 500 and 5,000 more people rise up against it and more terrorism occurs. The truth is you can't solve a dignity problem 
with military force. It was Secretary Gates who warned that our foreign policy has become overly militarized. Yes, we need a hammer ready, but not every civil war is a nail. There is a time to eliminate our enemies, but there's also a time to cultivate allies and encouragers among civilized Muslim nations. Those of you who are familiar with me know that I'm deeply committed to individual liberty, but I've learned through experience that this ideal can only be achieved by recognizing, as Bismarck said, that policy is the art of the possible. We need a foreign policy that recognizes our limits, preserves our might, and a common sense conservative realism of strength and action. We can't retreat from the world, but we can't remake the world in our own image either. We can't and shouldn't disengage from the world, but we also shouldn't engage in nation building. We can facilitate trade, we can extend the blessings of freedom and free markets around the world, Here's how I think we could do it. Here's how I see the most important principles that should drive America's foreign policy. First, the use of force is and always has been an indispensable part of defending our country. War is necessary when America is attacked or threatened, when vital American interests are attacked or threatened, and when we have exhausted all other measures short of war. While no foreign policy should preclude the use of force, Reagan understood that the war, or that war in general, should never be the first resort. Eisenhower, Eisenhower understood this also when he said, belligerence is the hallmark of insecurity. The war in Afghanistan is an example of a just and necessary war. I supported the decision to go into Afghanistan after 9-11, I still do. America was attacked by Al-Qaeda. There was a clear initial objective, dismantle the Taliban, deny Al-Qaeda safe haven. The invasion showcases the best of modern military, the best of America's modern military, and our ingenuity. We went in with special forces, heavy air power, and formed critical alliances. The Taliban were ousted from power, and Al-Qaeda fled. We kept a limited force in Afghanistan to wage counterterrorism, and we understood, at least at first, the limits of nation building in a country decimated by over 30 years of constant war. Only after our initial success did the lack of a clear objective give rise to mission creep. Today, Afghanistan is more violent than when President Obama came into office. He deployed 50,000 new troops to Afghanistan, nearly doubling our forces. He added $120 billion to the deficit to pay for it. And yet, the results are discouraging. The leading cause of death among our soldiers now in Afghanistan comes from enemies disguised in uniforms of our allies. 1,422 soldiers have died since President Obama ordered the surge. We have now spent more money in Afghanistan than we did for the entire Marshall Plan. And yet after killing bin Laden and toppling the Taliban, it's hard to understand our current objective. Stalemate and perpetual policing seems to be our mission now in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. A precondition for the use of force must be a clear, a clear end and a goal. We can't have perpetual war. A second principle is that Congress, the people's representative, must authorize a decision to intervene. Reagan's defense secretary, Caspar Weinberger, said when he outlined a systematic approach to sending Americans to war, he said that there must be a clear consensus. A critical component of this doctrine is support from the American public. The Libyan war is a, a perfect example of the wrong way to do things. We fought a war without the approval of Congress or the American people. President Obama claims that our military was being volunteered by others to carry out missions in Libya. He fundamentally misunderstands our republic. Let me be very clear. France does not send our men and women in uniform to war. The United Nations does not send our soldiers to war. Congress, and only Congress, can constitutionally initiate war. The war in Libya was not in our national interest. It had no clear goal, and it has led to less stability in Libya. Today, Libya is a jihadist wonderland, a sanctuary and a safe haven for terror groups across North Africa. Our ambassador was assassinated. Our embassy was forced to flee overland to Tunisia. Jihadists today swim in our embassy swimming pool in Tripoli. 
The Obama administration, urged on by Hillary Clinton, wanted to go to war but didn't anticipate the consequences of war. Libya is now more chaotic and America is less safe. War shouldn't be a unilateral decision taken in the isolation of the White House, but that is what happened. In failing to seek congressional authority, President Obama missed a chance to galvanize the country. He missed a chance to lead. A president who recognizes the constitutional limitations of power is not weakened, but actually empowered by the public debate that comes with the declaration of war. I support a strategy of airstrikes against ISIS, but I think our air power must be used to rebalance the tactical situation. I think that the situation is a danger as it currently exists. I think we need to rebalance the situation in favor of the Kurds and the Iraqis, and we need to defend Americans and our assets in the region. Just as we should have defended our consulate in Benghazi, so too we must defend our consulate in Erbil and our embassy in Baghdad. I don't support arming the so-called Sunni moderates in Syria, though. I said it a year ago, and I say it again now. The ultimate sad irony is that we're forced to fight against the very weapons we send the Syrian rebels. The weapons are either indiscriminately given to what I call the less than moderate rebels, or simply taken by the moderates, taken from the moderates and given to ISIS. 600 tons of weapons. You've got people on my side and the other side saying, we didn't give enough help. 600 tons of weapons have gone into Syria. Inadvertently, I think we have created a safe haven for ISIS, and ISIS is stronger because of our weapons that have flown into the civil war. Although I do support the call for defeating and destroying ISIS, I doubt that a decisive victory is possible in the short term, even with the participation of the Kurds, the Iraqis, and other moderate Arab states. In the end, only the people of the region can destroy ISIS. In the end, the long war will only end when civilized Islam steps up to defeat this barbaric aberration. A third principle is the belief that peace and security require a commitment to diplomacy and leadership. Around the world, we see the consequences of failed leadership and absence of leadership after six years of this administration. Military force is meaningless if our leaders can't reinforce American diplomacy through engagement and leadership. President Obama never invested in relationships with Congress. And the same is true of his foreign policy. To have friends, you have to be a friend. You've got to show up. In the run-up to the Gulf War in 1991, Arab nations believed that once President Bush drew a line, he wouldn't let Iraq cross it. And President Bush, he didn't dance on the Berlin Wall when it crumbled. Instead, he worked behind the scenes to help the Cold War end calmly. In the light of this new threat posed by ISIS, I believe it's even more imperative that Tehran and Washington find an effective diplomatic solution for limiting Iranian enrichment program. A nuclear-armed Iran would only further destabilize a region in turmoil. Another diplomatic challenge is Russia's military intervention in Ukraine. Putin's actions not only threaten Ukraine, but represent a threat to the post-Cold War European order. I support the sanctions that the U.S. and the European Union put in place against Russia. I also agree with the measures taken at the NATO summit to increase the alliance's military preparedness, especially increased European spending. We need to use sanctions and defense spending to achieve a diplomatic settlement that takes into account Russia's long-standing ties with Ukraine and allows Kiev to develop its relations both with Russia and the West. As Kissinger put it, if Ukraine is to survive and thrive, it must not be either side's outpost against the other. It should function as a bridge between them. Ukraine is geographically and historically bound to both regions. We will need to understand that even with our help, Ukraine will not be able to stand up to Russian pressure unless it undertakes some fundamental reforms, such as stamping out corruption, corruption and restructuring its energy sector. This brings me to the last principle I'd like to discuss today. We are only as strong as our economy. Admiral Mike Mullen, then the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, put it succinctly, he said, the biggest threat to our national security is our debt. A bankrupt nation doesn't project power, but rather weakness. Our national power is a function of the national economy. During the Reagan Renaissance, our strength in the world reflected our successful economy. 
low growth, high unemployment, and big deficits have undercut our influence in the world. Americans have suffered real consequences from a weak economy. President George W. Bush understood that part of the projection of American power is exporting American goods and culture. He successfully brokered 14 new free trade agreements and negotiated three others that are the only new free trade agreements, we, free trade agreements we've had. We haven't had much of anything under this president. Instead of just talking about a so-called pivot to Asia, what we need to do is prioritize negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership by year's end. Free trade and technology should be our greatest carrot, the greatest carrot of our statecraft. Trade is a critical element to building a productive relationship with other nations, including China. While our relations with China are complicated, trade has drawn us together, and mutual investment can also play a constructive role. In an era in which geopolitics could drive us apart, we need to look for new areas for the U.S. and China to cooperate. Promoting free markets should be a priority. The only long-term strategy that will change the world, though, is fostering successful capitalist economies that increase living standards and connect people through trade. From Kiev to Cairo to Tunis, we are witnessing a historic time of protest against the injustice of overbearing and corrupt governments. If the long war is ever to end, we must understand the frustrations of the Arab street. It isn't always abject poverty or religion that motivates recruits or sets off conflict. Often it's the despair and humiliation that comes from overbearing government. 26-year-old Mohammed Bouazazi, a Tunisian street merchant, set himself afire and began the Arab Spring. He was an aspiring entrepreneur, but he was foiled by a corrupt government. Bouazi had a dream. He, he'd saved for a pickup truck, but cronyism and overbearing government stifled his dream. Constantly harassed for money he didn't have, Bouazizi doused himself in kerosene and lit a match. My great-grandfather came to this country with a dream not unlike Bouazizi's. He peddled vegetables until he saved enough to purchase a truck. It elevated him to what we then called a truck farmer, a level that allowed him to purchase a home and a small bit of land. The difference between America in the late 19th century when my great-grandfather came and the Middle East now and South Asia and Africa and South America is that bribes and cronyism weren't necessary here. You could get a license. You probably didn't even need a license in those days. You could just go to the street corner and start selling vegetables. Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto spoke to Buazizi's brother, and he asked him if he left a, a legacy. And his brother responded, of course. He believed that the poor had the right to buy and sell. Something as simple as that could revolutionize and transform the Middle East. Tonight I've outlined the principles that we must remember if we're to advance security, peace, and human dignity. These principles of conservative realism are a return to traditional Republican values. They recognize our limits and they realize our might. Americans yearn for leadership and for strength, but they don't yearn for war. Our enemies should bear witness to the unmatched and unstoppable American force that was justifiably unleashed after 9-11. They should know that terrorism will never defeat America, that America will never be defeated by terrorism, that it will only awaken and embolden our resolve. The world should also know that America aspires to peace, trade, and commerce with all. That though we will not abide in justice, we will not instigate war. That our noblest intentions are sincere, and war will always be our last resort. And that our reluctance for war must not be mistaken for a lack of resolve. They must remember that the exceptional ideas that formed our republic unify us in the defense of freedom and we will never back down in the defense of our naturally derived inalienable rights. Thank you very much.